welcome to another episode of the Tuesday Tune. My name's Steve, I run Vorsprung Suspension up here in Whistler, and this week we are going to talk a bit about frequency. We're going to have a look at the relevance of frequency considerations uh, to suspension and really try and understand what it is. Now, frequency itself is a concept, it's not a physical thing. So it's a measurement, time-based measurement of how often something is happening. In the case of vibrations, which is any kind of uh, oscillating, sort of repeating motion or force, um, frequency is basically how often that reverses direction. Obviously, this is very relevant to suspension. So we'll go through some of the basics of frequency analysis and consideration, uh, how this is typically analyzed for motor vehicles, uh, how that is relevant or not relevant uh, to mountain bikes. And from there, we'll have a look at some of the considerations that this brings up when it comes to setting up your own suspension and understanding how the adjustments work, uh, why it is that certain things will affect you know, one particular scenario and why they'll affect another. What we have a very poor graph of right here is a vibration transmissibility. What that basically means is what the input is in terms of force and displacement versus what the output is. So the input at very low frequency, so this is frequency on the x-axis, transmissibility on the y, transmissibility ratio on the y-axis. At zero frequency, so very, very slow movements, the ratio starts at one. And that means however far, uh, however far the input moves, it will take the, the sprung mass with it. And so what that means, I'm gonna use this bottle of oil here, on a rubber band to illustrate. So what that means is that in a steady state, this is the sprung mass, this is the spring. If you lift that up very, very slowly or down, this distance doesn't really change. And so what that means is that this is moving exactly as far as the input. So the input being my hand, the output uh, being the sprung mass here. That means that we have transmissibility ratio of one. They're both moving the same distance. Everything has what we call a natural frequency. And that natural frequency is basically determined by the ratio uh, of the spring stiffness, in this case the rubber band, to the mass, uh, and the square root of that ratio, actually. So what that means is that what a natural frequency is, is essentially if I just let that bounce there, it will always bounce at the same frequency. Now, in this case, I'm using a rubber band. It actually has quite a bit of material damping in it, so it does slow it down. Any kind of mass spring system uh, will behave in that manner unless there is damping to slow it down. What happens, though, is that at a certain frequency, at that natural frequency, any inputs at that frequency, especially if they can be maintained at that frequency, end up with an infinitely high transmissibility ratio, and that means that the thing is resonating. So in this case, it's really not hard for very small inputs in my hand to end up with very large inputs of this bottle just by matching its natural frequency. And so that is the definition of resonance, is when the input frequency matches the natural frequency and therefore things bounce further and further and further up, up and down until it's out of control in some way. So what happens once we introduce some damping? That means there is some degree of control of the amount of resonance that can occur. And you'll have noticed this uh, if you are riding your bike, for example, and you happen to find some rollers that just happen to hit the right frequency. If you're sitting down in particular, you'll notice um, that the bike is starting to bounce around a long way through its travel, a lot further than you would expect it to, and maybe further than the actual uh, distance, the vertical distance that the ground is changing by. So the elevation that the ground shifts by might be, let's say, two inches, but your suspension is moving four because you're essentially resonating. As the frequencies get higher, that transmissibility begins to drop. Once you get to the square root of two times that natural frequency, um, this is referred to as the undamped natural frequency, by the way. Once we get to square root of two times that natural frequency, then what happens is we get back to that one-to-one -one ratio. And that means that there is a certain frequency at which you can see that not much is happening here. So we go resonance, 
and then all of a sudden thing is basically able to stay where it is. As we get to higher and higher frequencies, what happens is that transmissibility ratio actually drops. It drops down closer and closer to zero the higher this gets. Now, keep in mind that what this is a ratio of is displacement in, displacement out. The, the interesting thing here though is that that ratio is relative. It doesn't necessarily mean that at these higher frequencies that there's less force being transmitted uh, because the force coming in through the wheel can be much higher. But you can see as we get to that, we're not getting anywhere near the same amount of motion as those slower speed inputs there. So what, what is the relevance of this? It basically shows us that increasing the damping stabilizes uh, any mass spring damper system. Now, this transmissibility curve makes two major assumptions that are relevant in some cases to some vehicles, uh, and particularly to industrial vibration isolation systems, but not actually an accurate measurement of anything for mountain bike suspension. The first assumption that it makes is that you have a fixed damping ratio, which would be a linear damper curve that is identical in both compression and rebound. Uh, we never have that. The compression and rebound damping are never actually the same. Uh, and so what, the response that you get always varies somewhat from this. The second thing it assumes is that the sprung mass is rigid. In a car, on a motorbike, there is some validity to that assumption. Obviously nothing is truly rigid, but there is uh, that is a close approximation of what's happening, particularly with the car. Now, with a bicycle, the rigid sprung mass is very low. So that means that the rider, being not only not rigid, but also being an active part of the suspension, is able to stabilize things. And so what that really means is that where this frequency is really critical um, for cars, the natural frequency is not so relevant for bikes. And so... The reason that I'm bringing this up and then telling you that it's irrelevant is because this is the traditional vibration theory. This also has absolutely nothing to do with velocity. This is really important stuff for, for car handling. And we sometimes see this brought into the mountain bike world and it really isn't relevant in the same way because the interaction between the sprung and the unsprung mass are completely different. The sprung mass is active, it's also uh, very flexible. Trying to model these things is of great difficulty. Um, <laughs> I know this because I've spent a long time trying to do it. But enough waffling on about that. Let's have a look at how different frequencies and different velocities uh, interact and how we can understand frequency as a tool to help us understand what adjustments we want to make setting up our suspension, what effect that's going to have. So on this plot, we have three different curves. We have one, this orange one, that's obviously very big slow motions. So the amplitude um, is very large. That means if this was representing the suspension, we have something that's moving a long way uh, and it's taken quite a long time to do it. So if we were to look at uh, the x-axis here as representing time and this y-axis as measuring distance from our you know, theoretical sag point, our, our right height. The highest velocities of this motion don't occur at the highest displacements. So the velocity is the derivative of this curve. So if we differentiate this curve at the top of the curve is zero, likewise at the bottom of the curve. And so that means that the velocity there is at zero. The peak velocities actually occur at the smallest displacement from our center point. So the orange curve represents a big, low frequency, high amplitude motion. The blue one re represents a higher frequency with a lower amplitude. So this is actually five times the frequency. Its amplitude is also one fifth of the orange curve. So we're going to an amplitude of one instead of an amplitude of five. Now, the yellow curve here has five times as high a frequency again and one-fifth the amplitude again. So the amplitude here is 0 0.2 instead of 1 or 5. And the frequency is five times as high as this blue curve, which makes it 25 times as high as the orange curve. Now what's very interesting that the gradient of all these curves is identical. Now the relevance of this, the peak velocity is the same. So what is the relevance of this? 
Well, what it means is that you can have big, high amplitude, slow movements that your low speed damping effects, or you can have very rapid back and forth accelerations that your low speed damping also affects. The difference between the two is acceleration. So even though the peak velocities are the same, because it's reversing direction and accelerating much harder at the higher frequency, lower amplitude, what we're seeing is that, you know, for something that would represent very small stutter bumps, as opposed to, you know, large motions of the rider on the bike, what we're seeing is much sharper acceleration. That means that your low speed damping, for example, can affect these really big, slow movements, slow seeming movements, uh, because they're low frequency of the suspension. It can also be affecting the wheel's ability to follow the ground at these higher frequency, lower amplitude events. So very small, you know, corrugations in the ground, for example, um, can be immensely affected by low speed. And that's why some people uh, like to look at high and low speed compression damping as being small bump and big bump. It isn't strictly true, but there is definitely some validity to that, that line of thought.